What's up everybody? Avid Assistant here. Welcome to 2024, um, a year that will, fingers crossed, hopefully be filled with a lot more opportunity for film and TV professionals um, than 2023 was. Now I don't know about you, but when I was thinking about resolutions for the new year, I decided I want to get on top of this channel and start having a release schedule weekly going forward. And when I was looking for some inspiration of which topic to start with this year, I started going through the comments, so I'm trying to get a vibe of where people were at and what they'd like to know. And I just kept coming across quite a lot of kind of anti-Avid comments, which for stars is a bit odd on an Avid specific YouTube channel. But it gave me an idea. I decided to put together 10 of the best Avid specific features, so really great features that can't really be argued with that I don't think are present in other NLEs. To, you know, still try and fight the corner for Team Purple a bit, since, um, you know, uh, people have been pretty hard on them lately. So maybe you're already familiar with all of these, maybe you're not. Um, hopefully you'll get to learn something new. Either way, this is enough intro. Let's get into it. So to get us kicked off, we're going to talk about the send to function. So my first introduction to this function um, was to uh, send sequences to Sorens and Squeeze, uh, which was a separate media encoder app um, that used to be bundled along with Media Composer years ago. It wasn't made by Avid, but it was bundled along with it. It's been killed off, it's obsolete now, you can't really get it anymore. Uh, but it served the same purpose of what Compressor does for Final Cut or for what Adobe Media Encoder does for Premiere. It's a real, real shame that it went away. It essentially allowed you to send your sequence directly to Sorensen and then chain a whole bunch of different encodes to different destinations and you know leave that running and then you can just set set and forget all your deliverables and get them done. Now it wasn't actually until a good while after Sorensen was fully died off um, that I realized that there's still a good use for send to. In Avid if you have a sequence open and you go file send to make template you can make and save a, a specific export template allowing you to export a sequence out to multiple different export settings and then you can even set what to do with that export once it's done so you can say open in QuickTime player so that as soon as it's done I might want to review it right away have your export open up in compressor once it's done uh, if you just want to export out see a, a DNx um, you know high res export and then have compressor or resolve or whatever else um, do the encoding you can set it to automatically open up in that app once it's finished it is a really great and often overlooked automated export function allowing you much more flexibility with how you get your timelines out especially to different formats bulk edit find and replace now when this function was introduced i believe towards the end of 2020 i think it was 2020.10 if i'm right um it it was a complete game changer for me i was an assistant editor on a on a large feature film at the time um, on an animated feature film, we were doing lots and lots of renders out for different departments and for different purposes all the time. And we had lots of metadata to manage. And we actually updated a couple of the Media Composer machines to this specific version for this specific reason. Because it allowed us to batch edit metadata of a whole bunch of clips at once. It's essentially having a batch renamer in the bin. Now, I, ha I say bulk edit slash find and replace because for some reason they're two separate functions. Um, I don't know why they're not grouped together under the one window like a battery namer would be, but either way in the bin we can select a whole bunch of clips and batch edit almost any of the bin metadata columns. Um, we can uh, search for a string of text and replace it with nothing or with a specific designation. Uh, we can create specific chains in order to create a specific text entry. We can save those chains and recall them later and use them elsewhere. It has been a monumentally invaluable tool for me and probably the one that I miss the most when I go in somewhere and they're still on 2018 or on earlier version because I really, really, really love this feature. Um, I think it should be put into all NLEs. It's fantastic. Next up, the email function. So this is a really, really simple one and it's been around in Avid for as long as I can remember. And essentially all it is is you go into your settings into your user settings there is an entry called email and you go in there and you can configure all of the login details for your email account um, i found it kind of works best with a microsoft account but i have got it to work with the gmail as well and once you do that you can set avid to 
actually send you an email once it completes a, you know tasks like an export or a render of a timeline. Meaning that you don't have to sit in front of the computer to wait and see if it finishes. You can go and get a cup of coffee or go and get your dinner while um, an export's rendering out and your Avid will email you and let you know that it's done. Next up is metadata management. Now, metadata is handled differently in each NLE, of course, as it would be. But I can safely say I think Avid is the simplest and the most comprehensive uh, in terms of adding new metadata columns and also using the ALE function to bring in, you know, vast amounts of metadata straight from the camera as well. At any given time, I can right click and add a new custom column in the bin and type in new metadata that will then be attached to that clip for the duration of the project and can be exported out as part of an ELE as well. And not only can I very, very easily edit and change and add all this metadata, especially with the new edition of bulk edit, but I can also reflect this metadata as burn-ins in timelines, even custom metadata entries that I've added to clips in the bin. This is something I found particularly useful in animation and VFX workflows, where we had to assign uh, a label to each individual VFX or anim shot on the timeline uh, to denote what stage in the process they were at. You know, so whether they're at previs, anim, LRC, um, you know, we would be able to have a one time code generator that didn't have to be updated or edited throughout the timeline. It would just be reading the entry in the label bin column on a per clip basis and then displaying that as a colored burn-in on the timeline. It's fantastic. Next, we have custom keyboards and settings for workspaces. So I don't know how many of you have used this, but there is a setting that allows you to set Avid to automatically switch to different keyboards and other different settings when you swap uh, workspaces. And how this can be particularly useful is, say you're someone who likes to have lots and lots of um, you know keys mapped to your keyboard, but you've essentially ran out of all of the available keys and modifiers to map within Avid. Well, if you have a bunch of keys mapped for a specific function, say like a lot of your keys that you're mapping are for effects purposes, you know, to do with um, key framing and masking and edit points and, you know, stuff like that, effect editor controls. Well, then the better thing to do would be to create another keyboard and name it the same as your effects workspace. And then you, en <coughs> and then you enable this setting which states that any settings that match the name that you set here will be toggled on once you switch to this workspace. This means as soon as I jump over to effects, it's going to change the default keyboard layout to my effects keyboard, allowing me to have essentially all the keys that I need for any given task available to me on my keyboard and not have to be mapped to the GUI um, or brought in from menus and, and different places like that. It can be really, really nice if you have a whole bunch of keys that you want for that particular purpose and you don't want to have to go back into your settings and manually toggle on the keyboard that you want. Next, we have live bin readouts. Now, this is another kind of semi-new-ish feature. And essentially, what it does is very, very simple. In your bin, um, if you don't have any clips highlighted, then in the bottom right, there will be a live readout of all the clips that are in that bin, a count of how many, and the total duration of all of those clips if you were to lay them all down on a timeline. Now, as you select different clips or select a you know group of those clips, you make a selection, that live readout will change to reflect that selection. So however many clips you've selected and the total duration of those clips together. Now I remember on earlier versions of Media Composer having to dump clips onto a timeline in order to ascertain that duration and also having to select a bunch of clips and hit the delete key to get a count of how many clips there were. And then you just have to be careful not to actually go through with the deletion um, You know, once you had got your, your count. Um, so this is an extremely welcome feature. It's it's a little thing, but it's it's something that I use all the time. You know, it's very, very nice. Next, we have audio track groups. Now, again, this is a, another relatively new one, um, one that you might not be familiar with, but we can now create groups of audio tracks, um, you know, grouped by whatever category or designation we choose. You can see here I've grouped one by dialogue, sound effect and music, you know, pretty standard. It allows us to toggle on and off just those tracks and those groups um, very, very quickly with just a click inside of the audio mixer. So if I'm in a sound workspace and I have my audio mixer up anyway, those buttons to click are along the side and will allow us to, 
you know, toggle on and off our different groups. I find it particularly useful um, if I need to do mix downs of a particular group or if I need to do, say, AAFs towards the end uh, of the project for turning over to online, uh, dialogue AAF or sound effects AAF. Um, this is a really fast way to isolate just those tracks. And speaking of mixdowns, I'm not actually entirely sure how mixdowns work in other NLEs. I've not ever had to use that function in the limited uh, time I've spent in other NLEs, but I'm pretty sure it's probably there, just creating baked media out of what's in your timeline and then using that. But in terms of making audio mixdowns within Avid, I can configure multiple mixes in one window, uh, decide whether they're going to be stereo mixes, mono mixes, uh, what they're going to be named, and then I can just hit go and it'll do a mix down of the dialogue, then it'll move down, do a mix down of the sound effects, then move down, do a mix down of the music. I don't have to do those individually in one go. It's, it's a bit similar actually to the send to function we talked about at the start, but for mix downs. And whoever came up with this definitely has spent some time delivering to online um, because I find this to be a huge time saver when we get to the end of a project and you're doing final turnovers and deliverables for sound live previews of clips in the source browser. Now I know there's still a lot of uh, editors who are com still coming to terms with the new uh, user interface of Avid and in particular with the source browser, which actually debuted back in 2018. You know, it was a bit before the new UI. Um, you know, a lot of people are still used to either bringing in material using um, the old fashioned import window or dragging and dropping in an MDB file or even just dragging and dropping media into a bin. But if you are one of those people and you haven't yet spent a lot of time with the source browser, here's another reason to try it out. Once you're in the source browser, if you're in the uh, link mode and you're browsing along and you, you are looking at a folder containing relatively friendly clips, so say H.264s, ProRes's, DNX, MP3s, WAV files, any of the more Avid friendly codecs, which these days on the latest version is quite a lot, you can actually load these into the source monitor and play them without even bringing them into Avid. So if you just double click them on the source browser, since this is the default setting to load them into the source monitor, you can then play them through um, and test them out and trial them before you do an ingest. I find this particularly useful for um, auditioning music and sound effects. Since we have a both a search and a filter function there as well, so I have a very large um, sound effects library, so I can search in there for the sound effect that I want. So say I want an explosion, I can type explosion into there. Then any sound effect with explosion in the name will come up and I can listen to them all there and trial them and preview them and then only ingest the ones that I think will work. <coughs> and when it comes to video clips, this gets even more impressive. If you just switch over to frame view and then browse your video clips and you can make them whatever size you want and the source browser however large you want to, to view them properly. If you click on any one of these thumbnails, however, you can use your JKL keys to play down the video inside the thumbnail and just preview it that way. You don't even have to load it into the source monitor behind the um, source browser. You can just audition all the clips there and then just ingest what you want to ingest. Now, don't get me wrong, for my main rushes, I still transcode using Resolve, but for everything else, I'll always open up the source browser, which I have mapped to Shift-I for ingest. It's shaping up to be a really great ingest window, and I covered it in much more detail in my uh, video on ingesting in Avid. Now, I did say I would talk about 10 great features of Avid Media Composer, which of course now leads us into our 10th and last, but certainly not least, feature, uh, which is of course, Phrase Find and Script Sync. Or as it's now called, as of August this year, Phrase Find AI and Script Sync AI, even though it was always kind of AI, it's just, it's now Avid's own code, they're not licensing it, so it's got a slightly new name, that, that, that's all. But with the advantage of it being now Avid's code, there, there are updates and improvements coming with each version to it. Small and incremental, but they're coming. But this isn't the video to talk about the recent changes. I just want to talk about phrase find and script sync as a whole, as it's always been. Allowing us to just go Command F and open up the find window in any Avid project, type in any line that we know is spoken at some point in our production, and it will load up all the sequences and clips where that line is spoken. And then if we double click on any one of the entries that come up, it will load it up in the source monitor at the point in time where that line is spoken. Really, really useful. I'd say phrase find is particularly useful, probably on factual. You're maybe dealing with lots and lots of interviews, and you might not necessarily have the time or resources to keep it all super logged and organized, 
um, especially not everything. And so phrase find might be a really good way to find something that you know you've seen and you've heard at some point, but you just can't find it uh, in among the chaos of all of that footage. Well, it definitely has a place in factual, especially now that you can generate a transcript of any clip at any given time. Script sync shines brightest in scripted environments. This is because it allows us to have a script bin, so a full bin just showing the script, and to have all of our um, camera setups, all of our slates, in there with lines representing each take, not unlike a marked up script, with little marks picking out what we call script marks, allowing us to have a script view, view the whole script and jump to a specific slate camera angle at a specific line. And not only that, uh, once it's set up properly, it nullifies the purpose of the marked up script as, as a paper copy in edit, since we have that exact same function there within our avid, within our bin that we're drawing our rushes from. We can see at any given line how much coverage there is covering that line. And if there are any lines that aren't particularly well covered, that becomes apparent really, really quickly. It's an invaluable function that avid has become very well known for in the scripted world for a long time now, especially on larger tentpole projects, particularly on North American projects. Right, so no doubt I will still have a number of anti-Avid comments on this video as well, on the likes of, you know, yeah, but it doesn't have scene detection. And, you know, why did it take it so long to be able to generate a script? And the third-party plugin support is terrible. And while those are all very true and valid points, hopefully the 10 features that I've mentioned throughout the video will give you a reminder as to why Avid's still heavily in use, still isn't really going anywhere, and is still, you know, the preferred platform for many, 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 many editors like myself. Now, I don't say that to criticize Premiere or DaVinci or any other platform. I only say that because Avid has gets so much hate lately. I know that Resolve and Premiere can do very, very impressive things. And there may even come a day when um, Avid is obsolete and those platforms take over, potentially. I don't know what happens in the future, but... Either way, I don't see that happening in the foreseeable future. Avid is here in the now and it is very widely used in all of our beloved post houses. And so I just wanted to show a bit of appreciation for my primary tool of the craft of what I do. And now that I have done that, I guess I'll just say thank you very much for watching, especially to our Patreon members and our YouTube members. And I will see you all in the next video, which is going to be taking a look at remote working. It's already made, fully ready. It's up there. It's scheduled, it's ready to release. That one's not going to be late, it's not going to be rushed to the last minute. That one is primed, was recorded last year. So you can check that one out next week. And until then, I am signing off.